So, a uh, elderly woman is shopping in the mall. It's a busy holiday season when she realizes her purse went missing. It's gone. Hundreds of people. What's the chances she's going to find? So she runs to the customer service desk and thank God in that particular mall, they had the ability to make an announcement over the PA system. Anybody who found the purse, please return it. Gave a couple of signs. And within two minutes, a young 16-year-old boy who was honest, who obviously took this course, comes and promptly returns it to the woman who was so delighted. And she opens it to make sure everything is there. And she goes, hmm, can I ask you a question, Johnny? Sure. When I lost my purse, I had a $100 bill in there. That's it, as far as the cash. I see there's $100 here, but there's a 20, and there are a couple of 10s, and fives, and singles, 100. How did that happen so quickly, and, and how do you explain it? So young Johnny says, it's very simple. The last time I returned something to the rightful owner, the person did not have the right change for the reward. <laughs> so, how accommodating. This is a nice boy, an honest boy, and, and a boy who, who actually accommodates. Who accommodates, who knows how to drop a hint. Who knows how to drop a hint. Okay, like tell me how you're really feeling. Tell me what you're really trying to say. Okay. So, we're going to explore in this class the nature of ownership. What does it mean to own something? I own this phone? Why? Why do I own this phone? You pay dearly. Oh, I don't... You could say because I paid for it. We're going to explore two levels of ownership and then, of course, introduce Judaism's definition of what ownership is really about. So I'm going to direct your attention, dear friends, on page 136. I'm going to ask a young man who's been very involved and instrumental in helping our new facility and developing and cleaning and helping out. Uh, we're going to go to Albert on page 136, um, case study A. David and Mark are friendly work colleagues. One day, David is terribly hungry at work, and in a terrible rush to boot, he notices that Mark had stored some food in the office refrigerator. But Mark is out of the office and unreachable. David reasons that since Mark is absent, does not need the food that day, that he, and he could replace it for him tomorrow. Considering the circumstances and their friendly relationship, David is certain Mark would allow him to eat his food. In your opinion, may David eat Mark's food? Raise your hand if you think yes. Why? In one of the previous classes, classes there was a, a concept of This one... It feels similar, at least. Yeah. On the surface. Very good. The, he, the French that he said, it's a famous concept in Jewish law and in Jewish thought. One benefits and one does not lose. Right? And that's the concept we learned before. There's one difference though, Gershon, and I understand completely where you're coming from. And that is the consumption here. The other cases, it was about parking your car in somebody's driveway when they're out of town or doing something where there's no loss. Here, something exists and now disappears, magic, right? David Copperfield came and the sandwich disappeared. It's different, it's a little different. So if you know for sure the person doesn't mind, you have to quantify that as well. What is this, a, a reoccur recurrence where I do it regularly and the person says, sure, no problem? That's one thing. Here, I'm making an assumption based on our friendship, based on the fact that he's not 
he's gone for the day, so he's not eating this for dinner. And before he comes to work the next morning, I'm going to return it, right? Should be allowed to or not? This is the question on the table. Case A, the first one. Um, Mike, if we could now bring it up to Gershon, uh, page 137, case study B. Sarah throws along a street and discovers a bracelet lying on the sidewalk. She tries her hardest to track down its owner to no avail. So in your opinion... May Sarah keep the bracelet? Trying, but to no avail. Raise your hand, could she keep the bracelet after she tries to look for the owner? Yeah, what else is she going to do with it? What else is she going to go with it? Keep trying? Yeah. If she keeps it, at least there is a chance she might eventually find it. Ah, ah, okay, very good. As opposed to selling it off. Okay. So maybe you would say she could keep it in her possession, but not feel that it, it's her property, right? Wait, and you never know, something could come up, okay? By the way, these case studies are perfect because they're going to show us clearly the difference between secular law and secular thinking and Torah law and Torah thinking. In terms of what? The definition of ownership. It sounds like a simple question. Like you said, you paid for it. It's not so simple, actually. And we're going to see in a moment why. Um, case study C. Uh, Mike, if we could give this to um, Lori, please. Leah strolls along the street and notices Naomi at a fair, f fair distance ahead of her. She watches in dismay as Naomi's bracelet falls into the gutter. Naomi tries unsuccessfully to extract the bracelet from the gutter. She throws her hands up in despair, gets into her car, and drives off. When Leia reaches that spot, she lifts the gutter cover and succeeds in extracting the bracelet. In your opinion, may Leia, A, keep the bracelet, or B, must she attempt to locate Naomi and return it? What say you? I say she needs to get in touch with Naomi and say, I was lucky to open, to find your, to retrieve your bracelet, so I come and see you, here it is. She that's, needs to return it. That's if she knows... To whom it belongs. What's if she doesn't? Leave it there? Oh, no. no. Yeah. Why didn't she help? Why didn't she help her in the first place? She's standing by and watching. Well, she tried unsuccess unsuccessfully, right, to get it from the gutter. And she wasn't successful. Leah. Hmm? The owner Naomi of the bracelet tried unsuccessfully. was unsuccessful. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. That's right. So she could have done a little bit more? That's yeah. what you're saying? Right. She, didn't, she didn't. She didn't. Right. Mm -hmm. She threw her hands up. She gave up too easily. Right. She gave up too easily. Yeah, that's pretty reasonable. We're going to see in a moment how important these questions are. The answers to case study A, B, and C all depend on how we view ownership. What is ownership? Listen to this, because I think like last class, we're gonna, it's going to open our minds and our, to new ideas, okay? Is it a social construct to facilitate um, economic activity? to facilitate and create an environment of social order, for instance. And we're going to talk about it a little bit more. Do I own something because the law says that I do? Or does the law say that I own something because I actually do, because it's inherently mine? Inherently mine. What does social construct mean exactly as it relates to ownership? If there's an object, okay, and there's no way of me claiming, claiming rightful ownership over it, human beings are going to kill each other like animals. You ever see in wildlife, you know, how uh, the, uh, 
The leopard thinks he's safe with his kill. Thank God he could climb a tree, right? And then here comes the hyenas. Yep. And that's it. And they don't ask this question, is it okay for me to take, take it because it's not rightly yours. You want to live in such a society? So this is the first, the first suggestion or the first approach, or the first way of looking at social construct as it relates to having items, objects, property, being able to be retained as ownership so that we have civil uh, coexistence, civil coexistence. Because if not, if I could never acquire something and truly claim it as my own, guess what's going to happen? Somebody's going to come and take it from me. And then somebody's going to come and take it from him. This doesn't lend itself to a civil, civilized society. Does, is ownership a convenience or a necessity, I should say, so that we're able to live side by side, and that's why society decided there should be a concept of you owning that which is yours, not because it's inherently yours, not because you have some sort of deep bond with it, but because we have to create certain barriers, certain um, a formula of being able to acquire something to the exclusion of everybody else so that we have civil, uh, we, could, we could live side by side like a civil society and it doesn't look like uh, the wild out in the African plains, right? Where one animal comes and grabs it from the other. So I would like to hear before we go further, first of all, if we all understand this way of thinking and what do you think about that? Could the concept of ownership be based on that? Could it be partially based on that? Solely based on that or none of the above, right? The social construct. So you have the society where you have to have what is yours is yours, what is mine is mine, and we agree to that. And society determines how one rightly, legally acquires something for his or herself. Does that make sense? Could that be the only, the end all of ownership? Okay, so that's one idea, one way of thinking, right? The term we said it before is, just for the purpose of remembering this from the next one, social construct to facilitate economic activity. All right, let's take 138, text one. Um, Mike, let's bring this to Lorraine if we can. Hobbes and Hume argue that there is no natural mine or thine and that property must be understood as the creation of the sovereign states, Hobbes 1983, 1647, or at least, or at the very least, the artificial product of a convention entered into by all the members of the society to bestow stability on the possession of external goods and leave everyone in the peaceable enjoyment of what he may acquire by his fortune and industry. You hear this? In other words, there is nothing inherent about ownership. My car is not actually my car. It is just my car because society decided if my money, again, why is it my money, right? I worked for it. If it's not mine, then who, who is, is it? It's open for the taking. Could you imagine living in a world like that? I mean, we suffer enough already from civil uh, unrest. We know that crime, unfortunately, is on the rise. We know what we experienced, at, what was it, two summers ago? In some major cities around America. It was unbelievable, right? People just... These, you know, slay, uh, destroying these, uh, smashing windows and taking what was theirs. We don't want to live in that society. But is the in inherent relationship between me and that which I own? No, according to this. As we said before, is a social construct. Absent any convention concerning right of ownership, people will be in a state of perpetual conflict. 
competing for control over the land or property that they desire, and we know what the end's going to be. It's going to be uh, mayhem. It's going to be it's going to be a world of of chaos. Now, we're going to see another way of looking at this, of ownership and the relationship between the human being and that which is his or hers. Page 138, text 2. Mike, if we could bring it to uh, Sandy on this side. John Locke, on the other hand, was adamant that properly, property could have been instituted in a state of nature without any special conventions or political decisions. Locke did not base his resolution on this difficulty on any theory of universal, even tacit, consent. Instead, in the most, passage, in the most famous passage of his chapter on property, he gave a moral defense of the legitimacy of unilateral appropriation. Thought the earth be common to all men, yet every man has a property in his own person. This nobody has any right to but himself. The labor of his body and the work of his hands, we may say, are properly his. Whatsoever then he removes out of the state that nature hath provided, and left it in, he hath mixed his labor with, and joined it, so, joined it to something that is his own, and thereby makes it his property. It being by him removed from the common state nature placed it in, it hath by this labor something annexed to it that excludes the common right of other men. Yeah, is that English? <laughs> Right. Very good. So here we have a completely different way of looking at it. Ownership is an inherent reality. There is a relationship between the person and the owner. In other words, property is an extension of the person who owns that property. It's not random where society decided this is mine because we have to create parameters so that we don't kill each other over this object. No. When I say something is mine, there's an inherent relationship and connection. My hands, for instance, that I'm using here, I use hands a lot, right? Are mine. Why are my hands mine? Because they're kind of attached to me, right? So when I use my hands to pick fruit from a forest, the fruit now become mine as well. In its natural state, the fruit wasn't mine. But because I, quote, mixed my labor with it, it becomes joined to my person and therefore mine. That's another way of looking at it. Here, it's a different level. It has nothing to do with what we said before, social construct or for practical purposes, society determines. No, 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 no. My hands are mine. I work for something with the labor of my hands. My talents, I invested, and now these hands that belong to me have brought something from the outside in that now is inherently mine. You see the difference? It's a big difference. So my car is mine because I acquired it through my labor. That's why it's mine. There's an inherent relationship there. So, uh, societal convention and law don't create my property rights they merely react to them. They react to the reality of the inherent relationship and ownership of that which I acquired. So the law recognizes my property rights and considers me the owner of my property. Why? Because it is inherently mine. Right? So as the question we had before, what comes first? What was that? Some crickets. Okay, somebody has a question. Oh, that's okay. So here's the question for this very wise audience. Which of these two resonates with you more? A, it's a society, society uh, has this arrangement because we need to, if not, people are going to grab from each other and claim ownership, just like I claimed ownership over this phone, or there's an inherent connection, a relationship, because I acquire this through my own labor. Which one, A or B, 
resonates with you more? Those who think B, raise your hand. Those who think A, I said it in that order for a reason. Really interesting. Uh, Aaron, you want to explain? I'm thinking anybody who lived in a socialist state probably would not go along with A. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. No, B. You nailed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But on the other hand, B, if somebody just takes something and makes it theirs by taking it, somebody else may try to take it away from them. So you need societal bounds on, let's say, transfers of property. <laughs> So perhaps we can, very good point, but perhaps we could say it's a little of both. It's a little of both. You know, there could be circumstances that society decides it's mine and then all of a sudden that somehow changes, uh, changes hands or whatever it may be. Yeah? Well, I think sometimes you can say you've earned something, but you can still share it because you've earned it and it's your choice. Yeah. How you want to use it. Yes, that's for sure true, but we're talking about a step before that. Yeah. What determines what is rightly mine and why? That's the big question. Why? Why is something mine? What's the definition of ownership? Yeah? I think <clears throat> as long as there is absolutely no disagreement between different people, then B makes perfect sense. The moment, the moment there is any disagreement between people, and there is always some conflict or disagreement between people, B in and by itself, which is sort of a natural kind of, yeah, I pick the fruit from the, from the tree, that, and nobody else is around, therefore it's mine and life is good. Mm -hmm. B makes sense. But the moment there are people who disagree about who owns something, because both of them need it, ah. and society lives in, in a... Uh, there's never enough for everybody, okay? At that point, you need something additional to, 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 to resolve that societal conflict over natural ownership. You know, you remember you said there's never enough for everybody. It depends on our attitude, right? Yeah. There's this comedian, his name is Brian Regan. You ever heard of him? So we, kids were listening to him one day. You know, it's hard to find some entertainment that's kosher. He's a squeaky clean and very, very funny. See, he was talking about the stress he had as a nine-year-old kid in school playing musical chairs or these games they would have at birthday parties, like he was supposed to have a good time and he came home, please never send me to that place again. So the first time he played musical chairs, he, before the game started, he said to his teacher, hold on, there aren't enough chairs for all of us. You know, that's the idea. And as he tells the story, he was told, of course there aren't. I'm teaching you a little bit about life. There's never going to be enough for everybody. So you better move quickly, right? Here we have exercise 5.1. Based on A and B, which one? Return to the opening case studies. I respond to the questions based on the perspectives of text 1 and text 2. May David eat Mark's food, based on text one or text two. May Sarah keep the bracelet. May Leah, A, keep the bracelet, or B, must she attempt to locate Naomi and return it? Now we're going to go, and this exercise you could, we're going to come back to in a moment, but let's now talk about the Judaism's approach, because of course Judaism is not A and not B, because it's Judaism, right? I'm not even going to say it's C, but we're going to learn something profound and deeply spiritual and deeply meaningful about ownership and how serious ownership is, property rights, and I know this is something that some, oftentimes is, is, you know, can be contended and so forth. Judaism is very, very clear when it comes to this. And, I, and I, I'm almost certain this is going to be a new concept. So it's very exciting. What is the Jewish theory of ownership? A little background. We know 
that the third of our forefathers, I never understand if this forefathers, no, the third of our forefathers, <laughs> who was the greatest of our forefathers, the Chir Shavavos, the chosen one of our forefathers, who had the most difficult life, Jacob, a life of turbulence, a life of challenge. He rose to the occasion time and time again, and he was tremendously successful in every way. His second name was Yisrael. May sound familiar, Israel. Right? Very important personality in our history. Also the father of the 12 tribes. Every Jew is from one of the 12, and he's the father of the 12 tribes, right? So the story we know, he had a twin brother, Esau, Esau, who is very different than he. Esau, his brother, was a hunter, a man of the field. Yaakov, Jacob, was a man of the tent who spent his days studying Torah, contemplating the wonders of the world, his relationship with God, and so on and so forth. We know that Rebecca, their mother, Rivka, upon hearing her husband, Yitzchak, Isaac, saying, go out to the field before I pass away. Bring for me my favorite delicacies. Prepare for me. I go out, hunt. You know, typically, the, the righteous person doesn't take stuff that doesn't belong to him. He said, go out and go to acquire property that belongs to nobody. Don't steal it this time, okay? This is for Papa. Take it legally. And come, and I will bless you before I pass away. And it's a very difficult story in the Bible to understand. Because Rebecca, Rivka, calls her son Jacob and says, those blessings belong to you and your descendants, the Jewish people. I'm going to help you outsmart the father. How could Rebecca do that? And we've talked a lot about it. I'm not going to get into this story now in detail. And Jacob comes and he puts on the furry um, clothing, right, to pretend that he is Esau. He speaks like Esau a little bit. Actually, he speaks like Jacob, but he feels like Esau, and he gets the blessings. And as he's leaving, Esau, his brother, is coming. When Esau hears about this, he says to himself, he shouts, and he's frustrated, and he's angry, and he says, when dad passes away, Jacob is going to be I'm going to eliminate him. And Jacob has, is forced to flee, and he runs away to his uncle Lavan for two decades. He marries his wives there, the daughters of Leah, his cousins, Rachel and Leah. And Leah and the 12 tribes are actually 11 of the 12. And then we have the story of Joseph. But before all of that, the Torah says something incredible. The Torah tells us that as Jacob is walking and marching with his family towards Israel, he sends a messenger to his brother Esau. And the messenger comes back and he says, Jacob, bad news, very bad news in fact. Your brother Esau who wants to kill you, he means business. He's not playing games. In fact, he's coming right towards you with 400 armed men. This is a very big threat. Jacob knew his brother, he knew that he meant business, he was a hunter, he was a murderer, for him to kill was nothing. Didn't take much. So now is the showdown. So as part of the preparations for this great showdown after many, many years, it says that Jacob transfers his family and possessions to the other side of the river. He brings them to the other side of the river. Then the Torah describes something that Jacob went through, the, uh, a, a struggle he had with a mysterious character. We call him an angel. It was actually the angel of Esau, his brother. Let's take a look at page 141, text 3, the mysterious wrestling bout. It says, Jacob took his family. I'll give you a break, Mike. <laughs> Jacob took his family and transported them across the stream, and then he brought his possessions across. Then it says Jacob was left alone on the other side of the river and a man, which was an angel, dressed in a man, rested with him until the break of dawn and Jacob actually got the better of him. 
And then he says, bless me, and he gave, he gave him the name Yisrael. Why was Yaakov, Jacob, there on the other side of the river alone? He transported or brought or escorted his family and his possessions on the other, to the other side, moving in a certain direction. All of a sudden, he found himself on the original side, and he gets into this wrestling match, this MMA UFC match, with the angel of Esav. Why? What was he doing there? Ah, what was he doing there? So let's see the very next text. Your money or your life? Stick them up, right? Yep. Rabbi Lazar explains that the reason Jacob found himself alone and exposed to danger was because he had returned to get some small jars that had remained behind. <laughs> He forgot a couple of jars. I don't know if there was peanut butter and jelly in those jars. Some tuna, maybe some sushi probably. It must have been sushi. Why? Because it had to be worth it to go back and put himself in such danger. After all, he knew his brother's attacking. He didn't want to leave his family alone. Listen to this, friends, because it's incredible. Our greatest hero, Jacob, the one who fought against the enemy, the man of the tent, whose nature was not to fight, but stood up and stood strong and stood proud, the father of the tribes, returns because he left a jar behind? Was he so poor? Why was it so important? This episode informs us that righteous individuals, listen to this, but we got to explain, cherished their possessions more than their own bodies. Why do they care so much about their possessions? For they never touch stolen property. Now let me ask you, this is the righteous person who cares more for his possessions than his own body? That's a virtue of Jacob. That sounds like Asav. Some people like their money more than they like their lives or their wives or their husbands. Jacob, he left because he cherished his possessions more. How do we understand this? Ah, thank you, Baal Shem Tov, for bailing us out and teaching us a great, important lesson here. The Baal Shem Tov, the founder of the Hasidic movement, explains that there's more to material possessions that meets the eye. There's such an inherent connection, a deep personal, spiritual connection to your soul. You think that you came in contact with this possession or that you driving this vehicle or the other one, this garment or the by chance, no such thing. Baal Shem Tov says no such thing. Let us see text five. Uh, Mike, if we could pass it to Anna, please. The soul of ownership. The Torah is highly protective of people's personal assets. This is a result of the major spiritual principle that whichever material items we use, the garments we wear, the food we eat, or the utensils we utilize, we derive, we derive benefit from the spiritual force present within each item. For the existence of that item is sustained by virtue of the spiritual presence within it. Specific sparks of spirituality are embedded within each item, and through divine providence, items that are used by particular individuals harbor the specific sparks that are related to their soul. As a result, when we use a utensil, eat food, or wear a garment to satisfy our corporal needs, we thereby repair the spiritual sparks embedded within them because we subsequently serve God with the energy that our body acquired through this, that item. We must therefore be highly protective of our possessions, of whatever we own, out of concern for the individualized spiritual forces they possess. Amazing. So the Baal Shem Tov explains that every physical or material object contains what we refer to as a divine spark that needs to be sublimated, elevated, utilized for a godly purpose, thus revealing its true nature and purpose for existence. Our role in this world is to elevate these sparks that exist within the items and the objects and the materialism that we're surrounded by and reveal its inherent divinity contained within the physical. 
How do we accomplish this? By using the objects in which these sparks have, these godly sparks are used for a godly purpose. Now listen to this because this is incredible stuff. Every divine spark is related to a specific divine soul. Everybody has a divine soul. Every divine spark that exists within this iPhone, for instance, within this book, within this, they have the spiritual godly sparks that need to be sublimated, elevated, revealed for its true purpose, godly purpose. Every one of these sparks is related to a specific soul, which means a specific person. And every individual is responsible for elevating the divine sparks associated with the spiritual roots of their soul. Through divine providence, it's not by chance, through divine providence, the objects containing those sparks become part of the person's physical possession. I think, I want to tell you something because it's interesting. And sometimes it may happen to you in your life. So I'll share something personal. A little while ago, I was, you know, I drive modest cars. I'm, I need a vehicle to take me from point A to, to point B. I could care less what the car looks like. My wife cares a little bit more, a lot more than I do. You're a rabbi. You have to look good. You're suspectful. For me, I need four wheels and a steering wheel. And maybe some gas would be good. So I bought myself a, a modest car. It was a 2011. And I was very happy with it. Toyota uh, Camry. It is reliable. And then my wonderful child came from out of town. And a day later, boom! <laughs> she missed, I mean... It, it's, it's not my fault, and of course not. It's never your fault. It was a total loss. The car that I finally found, which is hard to find these days for the right price, it's not expensive, reliable, I know this make and model, I've had it before, I was happy with it, and somebody hit it from behind, hit him or her, I'm not gonna say which one, I have six children. Well, it's probably not Chesky, right? <laughs> and, uh, and that's it, so one Friday afternoon, a day after this, child of mine came to town, I get the call, and now I'm without a car. So my insurance pays for a rental, but eventually they're getting impatient, and now I gotta find a car. And I can't find a car for my budget that's decent. So I finally found something, and I'm telling you the story for a reason. And it looked very good, and it was the right price. I bring it to my mechanic, and he says, do you know what you just bought here? I said, yeah, very nice car. He says, well, I'm looking at it from I'm looking at it from the bottom, and I don't see, it's not very nice from the bottom. It looks like an oil field in the Middle East somewhere. Okay, you got holes all over the place. So I said, it can't be. I know the owner, he's trustworthy. He says, did he see the bottom or not? He says, return it and return it fast. It looks very nice from the outside, and it's, it drives very well. For whatever reason, months have passed, and this loaner car which my children call the gold gold cart because you can't find a car on the street like that. I'm still driving it. The other day, Naftali saw after Shachris, I was trying to start it and I was having a hard time getting it to start. The window doesn't close. I keep it closed. But the prayer helps. Right, you try to help me close the window. It's a very colorful, entertaining car <laughs> because it has mood swings. And when I... <laughs> When I use a feature, it decides it's staying in that position. I just hope it doesn't happen when I press on the gas. <laughs> uh, that's, but every day there's sort of prizes. Every day there's, and he, the, the guy says it's, he says, it's, uh, it's, it's reliable, don't worry about it. Okay, I'm not gonna worry. I, I definitely pray a lot in that car. But it's funny, it hit me. I, I, I haven't found anything, and this, I'm stuck with this car for now. And I'm fine as long as it drives. You know, it, the, the window was down for two weeks, and all I did in the morning was make sure there was no coyotes in the car and nothing else. But I, and then I studied this. Possessions that come into your domain. I think it's because that, this, that, and the other because my kid doesn't know how to check her blind spots. Yeah, that's true too. It's because this physical object needed to be in my domain. There's something inherent in the relationship in terms of the godly sparks 
and me and only I need to sublimate it, need to elevate it. I can't think of any other reason because this whole episode doesn't make any sense. And I've tried and I have two people I'm speaking to. Yeah, I'm going to find it soon. Usually they do it quickly. I know today nothing is available. But it, it finally dawned on me that there's something more at play that, does, that, that, that doesn't meet the eye. There's something there that I, I, I'm stuck with this uh, go-kart. And it sounds like a go-kart. sounds like a tractor, actually. <laughs> so there's a time and place where you sell something to somebody else. Or we're going to see soon, we lose something. You know what that means? If halacha, Jewish law, says it's rightly the new owners, and it belongs to them, that the inherent connection that I used to have with it, the sparks that I and only I could elevate within this physical object, that has expired, and now it belongs to somebody else. It's time for somebody else to do what that other person's soul needs to do by virtue of this newfound connection with the new owner towards this object. I'm trying to get a better vehicle. It's sticking to me like glue. It's not going away. And I've tried. And I'm, I'm really convinced there's something here. There's something there. This is what the Baal Shem Tov teaches. Everything is by divine providence, and there's nothing in God's physical world that goes to waste. I want to give you a very powerful example. Some, we, we used to show um, before COVID, and we should really start again, videos of the Rebbe, right? The Rebbe used to give out dollars as a blessing because the Rebbe taught that when two people meet, something good and positive should happen for a third person, namely charity. The Rebbe would use his right hand to give the dollars. He would stand, he was in his 80s, well in his 80s, and would stand for six, seven hours in a row, giving out dollars, blessings, answering people, counseling them, encouraging them. It was really incredible. Come on Shabbos and we're going to bring about it. Now the right hand is the hand, the preferable hand that you're supposed to use to give, to, you, to, to give a blessing. And in general, in Judaism, it's the preferable hand. It's the hand we do the mitzvah with. It's the hand that we cover our eyes with during the Shema. What was the Rebbe's hand doing when he was giving out dollars? Go home tonight and YouTube a Rebbe video and take a look. You know what it's doing? Nothing. It's not even moving a little. Because a tzaddik, a righteous person, a Moses, wastes nothing. Not even movement. Because they understand and they are in tuned to, to the divine spark and essence and purpose of everything that exists. And in their reality, there's nothing superfluous, there's nothing extra at all. Not even a movement. Every movement and every word and every that a righteous person makes is for a reason. So I could waste a lot of movements and a lot of words, which I do. A tzaddik wastes nothing. And take a look at that video. Somebody pointed it out to me. And I looked at it, and it's incredible. Usually when there's movement, especially for hours, you know, you turn positions. You know, you could, you could stand like this. You could rest your thing. It's laying there limp as if it has no life. Because the Rebbe wasted not even a tnua, not even a movement. And this is what we're saying here. Hashem orchestrates and governs everything that happens from the smallest detail to the biggest and everything in between. If there's a wind that comes and causes a leaf to hold on for dear life and eventually that leaf is ripped from that branch and falls on the ground, that was orchestrated by God Almighty for a reason. Just because I don't understand the reason, it doesn't make it untrue. The way the story is told is, the Jew is going down the street, a leaf falls down, the Jew picks it up and said, leaf, why did you fall? And he says, don't ask me. The wind blew and I fell. He says, wind, why did you blow? 
He says, don't ask me, ask the angel. I'm giving you the short version of the story. The, the angel of wind caused me to blow. Angel, why did you tell the wind to blow that caused the leaf to fall? The angel says, I don't do anything on my own. I have a big boss, God Almighty. So the Jew says, God Almighty, why did you tell the angel to cause the wind to blow so that the leaf fell? And you know what God says to the Jew? Turn that leaf over. And he turns that leaf over. He says, what do you see? He says, I see a little worm on the other side. He, God says, that little worm was baking in the sun. It was 110 degrees in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. And it was so parched, it was so dry, that it set up a warm prayer. I don't mean warm. <laughs> and it said, God Almighty, please help me. I have no kayak. I have no energy to move anymore. Help me out. I'm going to die. It's so dry. And God caused the wind through the angel. And it fell upside down. And now it had shade. And the worm said, thank you, God. That's the story. And that's the story. And that's the real story. That's the story of our lives. And when we think about it in this context, even when the going gets tough, and even when we are challenged, we have to understand if we live with this principle that every event and every m moment and everything that comes into my domain and I consider it as mine, my ownership, my possession, it's because my soul is inherently connected to the divine spark that exists Within the cell phone, it sounds very funny. Within that go-kart where the window doesn't come up. I need to utilize it for a godly purpose to transport me to Minion in the morning or to a JLI class, thus elevating the divine sparks that exist within the materialism we call a car. How do you like that? And why is it mine? Why, what does ownership mean according to the Torah? that there's an inherent spiritual connection between the divine sparks that exist within that object and my soul that only my soul could elevate. Now let's look inside for a moment. We all know, and all civilized societies, I hope know that stealing is wrong. But in real life, there are often what we call gray areas, like in case study A. I'm going to eat the sandwich, but he doesn't care, and I'm going to replace it anyway. And he had dinner. He went home for the night. Listen to this. Is it really stealing if I eat my colleague's lunch that he wasn't going to eat now anyway, and then buy a second lunch? What's the answer? The answer is, according to what we just said, absolutely. Logically, it shouldn't be a problem. But if I say that it's something that's in my possession, it's in my possession because it is inherently connected to my soul. And only my soul, I, is, are, is able to elevate those godly sparks that exist within that sandwich by you taking it away without permission. You've stolen my opportunity to elevate that sandwich that belonged to my soul. That only I could elevate. How do I know? Because by divine providence, it came into my domain, into my possession. So according to that, it's a problem to take the sandwich. Logically, it shouldn't be a problem. He's a friend of mine. I'm replacing it. No, but that sandwich is mine for a reason. And ownership is a serious thing. It's real. What is mine is mine inherently. You can't just take it away and make assumptions. Now, of course, if I give you permission with my consent, that's fine. Why? Because by me giving consent, it shows that I'm transferring the possibility of it being sublimated by you. That's what consent does. But without my consent, it's connected to my soul. It's inherently mine. So let's say... The gig example, we had a couple of classes ago. If I park my car in somebody else's driveway while they're away, and it has no effect on them, unless it's a Chabad car and it leaks oil and leaves a big stain. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about normal people here. 
But as I said before, the sandwich is different than the car park because here I'm consuming somebody else's property. And Jewish law takes a far more strict and stringent approach to when you consume something, where it's gone. Why? Because of what we just said. You've taken my godly sparks and you've consumed it and made it your own. Wrong. It's wrong things. Let me give you an example. He's going to give it in a moment. I'll, I'll tell it to you now. You know, sometimes a person's life is in grave danger because they need a liver transplant. They need blood. They need whatever it is that they need. And it's, it's, I have a cousin in Long Island who actually saves lives, an incredible rabbi in, in, in Great Neck, Long Island. And he's always looking for matchers. And we know that you have to have be the right match, proper match. If God forbid they try to implant or to donate a liver, a kidney, blood to the wrong recipient, you could kill the person. In the same way, this physical object with, which it, with its divine sparks that need to be actualized for a godly purpose has to be a match. And I'm the match. And the proof is divine providence proves that it belongs to me because it's in my domain, it's in my possession. You come along, you eat my sandwich without permission, you assume it's okay, but it doesn't work. Because spiritually speaking, that sandwich needed to be consumed by me. Maybe I had to make the bracha a certain way, whatever the reason was. Let's take a look on page 144, text 6. Uh, Mike, will have you read. If you enter a private orchard or garden, you may not pick its fruit without express permission from its owner. This applies even if the owner of the orchard is your dear friend and will certainly be extremely pleased to hear that you enjoy their fruits. Nevertheless, since the owner is unaware of your actions in real time, it is forbidden to benefit from the fruit. This principle applies in all similar cases. The public must be cautioned regarding this law because it is commonly transgressed due to lack of awareness. Right, so going back to A and B, the first two choices, whether it's a social construct or even inherently yours, here we're saying something far deeper. Here we're saying it must be utilized by you. And if I consume something with no permission, it's considered stealing. Now, is there a diff if let's say it's something that I would do regularly, and I know because the owner told me it's okay, whenever you're hungry, just eat out of my bag, am I allowed to do it? According to the Baal Shem Tov's interpretation, yes. Because the owner who is related to that object said yes. What does that mean? Divine providence indicates that these spiritual sparks contained within this food doesn't have to necessarily be sublimated by me. It could be shared by somebody else. Sometimes it's jointly. Sometimes it's exclusively. If for whatever reason I'm stubborn and I don't want to share my food, that's an indication that it belongs to me. I mean, I should share. So all of these have serious ramifications. Now we're going to talk about, you know, there's the finders, keepers, losers, weepers. Is that true according to Judaism? Generally speaking, a finder is legally obligated to make an effort to locate the owner of a lost property. I'm talking about according to the Torah. And we've had this law in past classes. But what is the lost property law? And we started the class this way. To what extent do I have to go out of my way? Uh, Mike will um, pass it to your wonderful wife across the table. Text seven. At common law, a person who found lost personal property could keep it until and unless the original owner comes forward. This rule applied to people who discovered lost property in public areas, as well as to people who discovered lost property on their property. Many jurisdictions have statutes that modify the common law's treatment of lost property. Typically, these statutes 
require lost personal property to be turned over to a government official, and that if that the property is not claimed within a set period of time, it goes to the finder, and the original owner's rights to the property are terminated. Okay. And Jewish law says you have to return it, and you have to return it no matter what. And we're going to read now Torah's verses relating to this exact law that we just mentioned. Jan, would you like to read for us on page 146, text 8? If the owner is not near you, or if you do not know the owner's identity, take it home with you and keep it until they come for it, whereupon you shall return it. Do the same if you find their donkey, garment, or anything else they have lost. You may not ignore it. May I not ignore it. So how does biblical law relating to returning lost objects differ from secular law? Number one, three distinctions. You cannot ignore a lost object. If you're walking in the street in America and you see something, a bag, am I obligated to pick it up? No. According to Jewish law, you have to take it and find the rightful owner. That's number one. Number two. The owner, the rightful owner, has to be actively sought out. You have to do whatever you can. You put up poster signs. You have to do whatever you can to find the, right, the rightful owner. And number three, um, there is an inherent relationship, an inherent connection between the lost object and the person who lost it. Why is the Torah go out and say you're obligated to look and you cannot give it away and you cannot consider it on your own, uh, uh, your own after a certain amount of time? And the answer is because of the explanation we said before. If an object belonging, remember the definition of ownership according to the Torah? There's a spiritual connection. If the object belong, belonging to that rightful owner who lost it is looking for it, I have to make sure that this lost item and its divine sparks waiting to be elevated, waiting to be utilized for a godly purpose that only the original owner or the rightful owner is able to accomplish. I have to go out and make sure this spiritual transaction or this spiritual elevation takes place. Now, how about, is there, first of all, is there any exception to the rule? And the answer is, there is an exception to the rule. What is it? If the owner had given up. If the owner had given up. Now, I would like to hear from our wise crowd here, when would somebody give up on a lost object? When? So I'm going to start off by saying the following. If somebody loses money, there's no identifiable sign. We could assume that the person has given up. We're not talking about money in a wallet with a license, identification, cash, or some other object where there's no identifiable sign. What happens when the person gives up? Why am I allowed to keep it? According to the explanation we just said. Ah, because that inherent ownership and relationship and connection between the original owner and the object has been severed by virtue of the fact that the person has given up on it. Not only is that object no longer in the person's possession, but once Torah law determines that the person has given up, for instance, if the person lost, lost something at sea, okay, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, yeah, good luck, right? Or unidentifiable sign to be able to say this is mine and it has this rip and this thing and that we could assume the person has given up thus this is the greatest indication that the inherent relationship and connection between the godly sparks that exists within that lost object that could own that previously was only able to be elevated by the usage of this person of that person has now been severed and now, I found it, guess what? Now it's mine. What does it mean, mine? 
it's inherently mine because I'm the one who found it. And it's the kind of object I'm assuming that the guy has given up. He has relinquished, in a way, ownership. Given up the hope for ever finding it. This is an indication by Hashem that this newfound o- object now belongs to my soul. And I have the responsibility to elevate it. You see? What am I supposed to do if I found a $100 bill in the street in middle of, uh, what is it, Mardi Gras? Right? How, what am I supposed to do? George. If I announce, who lost a $100 bill? I think I'll have a lot of takers. In fact, if a war is going to break out, then there's certain times Jewish law assumes that the person has given up. It says you're supposed to keep... Now, if the person has not given up on it, look at the text 9, page 147. If an announcement or notification regarding the discovered item was made and the owner did not come to claim it, the item should remain in the possession of the finder until the arrival of Elijah the prophet, which is a, which is a euphemism, which is a term that's used in Jewish law. It says before Mashiach comes, Elijah the prophet is going to tell us about his arrival. It means you got to hold it in your possession and not use it and wait for the owner to come. But that's in a case where we don't say the person has given up on it. We don't assume it. Why? A, there's an identifiable sign. Maybe B, it's a very valuable object that's one of a kind. The owner doesn't give up because it's one of a kind. It is clear markings. There's an initial, there's some discoloration. Ah, then I cannot assume that a person has given up. And Torah law says you got to hold on to it forever and ever until Elijah the prophet comes. And what happens when Mashiach comes? Mashiach and Elijah is going to reveal for us all of the answers to all of the dilemmas and all of the questions that we had throughout the age of Gullus, of exile. Now, the, to- the term that I said before, the Hebrew term for giving up is Yish. And there's a whole tractate in the Talmud. It was actually the first Talmud that I studied as a young boy in yeshiva called Baba Metzia, Eila Metzia Shalai. These are the objects that you have to, that you could claim of as your own if you find it. These are the objects which you have to call out and you have to look and seek the owner. So let us see page 147, text 10a. Mike will have uh, our Gabai Chazn property though. <laughs> there's, a lot, there's a lot of um, titles you have. All right. Okay, by mentioning the example of garment, the Torah teaches uh, us a law. Every garment is unique and contains features by which uh, it can be identified. We therefore presume that uh, its owner will seek its recovery and we are obligated to return it. This establishes a principle. Any article that has identifiable features is assumed to have an owner who seeks its recovery and must therefore be returned. By contrast, a lost article that no longer has owners who seek it because they have despaired of its recovery belongs to its finder, even if it uh, bears identifying features. Okay. So that's the idea of what we call yush, where we could safely assume the person has given up, and Jewish law therefore says it's no longer yours. Why are you allowed to keep it? Because Hashem has indicated... Circumstances, divine providence has indicated that the inherent relationship and ownership between the previous owner has been severed by virtue of the fact that the person has either given up on it for one reason or another, lost something at sea. Money lost without a wallet in a public fear, and so on and so forth. Okay, let's go to the next text, 10b, recovery from despair. Um, will I have Shelley read? If you discover a lost item on the seashore within reach of the tide or in an area inundated by a flooding river, you may keep it. This applies even if the item has an identifying feature. This law is derived from the command to return an article that was lost to your fellow and you found it, implying that the obligation extends to any circumstance in which an article is lost 
to its original owner, but is likely to be found by others. This excludes an instance in which the item is assumed lost not only to its owner, but to all people. In such an instant, the owner certainly despairs of its recovery. In other words, it has to be the kind of lost item that's findable, so to speak. And we can assume that the owner knows it's going to be found and there's the identifiable signs. But if it's not like that, it's the circumstances are different. Therefore, it's ownerless. It's ownerless. And finally, on page 150, text 11, um, we'll bring it to Sandy. Conscious ownership taken from the Maharal of Prague, the great-great-grandfather of the Alter Rebbe. Your property is not a part of your body from which you cannot be separated. I'm sorry, I'm just going to stop you for one second. This great <coughs> sage, philosopher, great thinker, he, again, he was the Zayda, the Elta Zayda, the great-great-grandfather of the Alter Rebbe, the great rabbi of Prague, is explaining for us and in 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 elucidating clearly explaining what we just said in a beautiful way. What's the logic behind it? We just talk so much about the inherent relationship between an object that I call my own because of its godly sparks that only I could elevate. All of a sudden, we're taking it, I'm saying, oh, oops, I guess now I have to elevate it. I just found a, uh, a lost cell phone and it's the latest iPhone. Okay, I guess, God, thank you for the gift. I'm going to try to elevate this as much as I can. I'll watch a lot of Chabad.org on here, and so on and so forth. Is this a joke? That's a reason. And you see how Torah is all connected. The law that tells us that the ownership has been transferred because the other person has given up, thus relinquishing any bond and inherent connection is a real thing. Because everything is orchestrated by God. So when we say the person has given up and despaired, as he mentioned, from ever finding it again, this is an indicative or an indication of its spiritual evolvement from one owner to another. From one rightful owner to another rightful owner. And what Sandy is going to read here clar clarifies it in the most beautiful way. I'm sorry. We'll start again. Your property is not a part of your body from which you cannot be separated. Rather, it is your possession, something external that belongs to you. Therefore, if you lose an item and it is no longer in your possession, and you have also removed it from your consciousness through abandoning the hope of its recovery, strict principles of ownership, ownership dictate that it is no longer yours it is ownerless. There you go. In other words, in order to be the owner of something, it must either be in my possession or at least present in my consciousness as something that belongs to me. If not, how is it mine? Yes, technically it's mine because I purchased it. But if it's not in my possession, no longer in my consciousness or any hope for finding it. It's now moved on somewhere else. Where? I don't know. If I did, I would go claim it. But I don't know where it is, so I give up on it. When I lose an item and despair of recovering it, both of these bonds of relation are severed, and there is no longer anything connecting me to this object. As a result, my ownership dissipates. And it now is transferred away to somebody else. Now we're going to conclude the class with the idea of what's called lifnim mishudas hadin, going beyond the letter of the law. Mike, we're going to come back up here. If we could give it to Denise on page 151, text 12, beyond the letter of the law. All the above accords with the letter of the law. Nevertheless, the good and proper course of action is to extend yourself beyond the letter of the law and return a lost item, even if its owner already despaired of its recovery. Thank you very much. The next te long text we're going to skip. It's not really relevant for this discussion. 
And I want to kind of bring this whole concept to home and see how we view things from a different perspective completely. In Jewish theory of ownership that we began discussing at the beginning of the class, what does it teach us? Ownership is a responsibility. It's not just a privilege. I can be privileged. Hashem has blessed me. With that privilege, instead of feeling better than somebody else, I could feel for more fortunate, but it should humble me. And I have to recognize that with material possessions comes great responsibility. If Hashem has blessed me with wealth, with relationships and connections, you know what he's telling you? Your soul has a unique responsibility to sanctify Hashem's name, to do something with it. What could be worse? What could be worse? When Hashem blesses an individual with good health, with a good mind, a loving family, material possession, and all the person does with it is enriches his life, enriches himself, enriches his ego, makes sure that he has as much as respect and honor from everybody else. Hashem says, you got the wrong message here. A little humility, a little responsibility. I've given to you as a gift. No, what gift? I'm a smart guy. I'm talented. I have a good work ethic. I've built my life for myself. Guess what? That old wheel of fortune, I'm not talking about the game wheel of fortune, could be turned and very fast, and I don't wish it on anybody, but this has happened. Hashem has control of that wheel. Hashem orchestrates that there's the haves and the have-nots. And if I am so foolish and so self-centered and narcissistic to take the blessings that Hashem gives me for free, that I didn't earn, to enrich my life and to try to make myself better than others or make others who have less feel inferior, bad mistake. And Hashem is not going to be very happy. Instead, our greatest in history, our greats, the little that God gave them, you know what they said? Abraham said, I am dust and ash. I don't deserve anything. Jacob, who served God with loyalty off the charts, challenged one after the other, says, Katainti. What a word. You know what Katainti means? God, I'm asking you to save my life from my brother who wants to kill me, but Katainti, I've become small from all of the kindness that you've given your servant. That's how a great person thinks. Was Jacob the servant? It's a rhetorical question. Of course he was deserving, but greats like Moses and Jacob and Abraham never expected anything. And they were really deserving. Hashem needs us to recognize that what I consider rightfully mine, it comes with great responsibility to maximize and to squeeze out the divinity and the divine sparks of whatever it is in terms of material possession that Hashem has given me and not to squander it and not to behave immaturely and not to flaunt it, to give charity, to look out for others, to help build a Jewish community. Then we're elevating the materialism and you know what's going to happen? God's going to give you more and more and more and more because you're doing the right thing with it. Because you're partnering with Him in the act of creation. You see how the Rebbe dealt with money. Every penny that, ha that, that came to Chabad was right away spent on building Yiddishkeit. This could be an organization, theoretically speaking, wink, wink, that is just filling up the storage houses we call bank accounts and annuities and who knows what. Where's the results? Where's the Yiddishkeit? Who's being affected? Show me. Show me the lives that have been changed. The Rebbe started with a little army and nothing in the bank. 
poor and took the little materialism and built some, an empire that has benefited the world the likes of we've never seen before. He was an international rebbe of the entire world. That's the way we're supposed to use materialism. That's the way we're supposed to view the blessings, the material blessings in our lives. And I conclude with the following. On the most basic level, based on our discussion here, respect for the purpose inherent in property means that we aren't allowed to destroy property. We're not allowed to use property that doesn't belong to us because it belongs to somebody else's soul. There's a great story where somebody said to the Tzemach Tzedek, who was the grandson of the Alta Rebbe, the founder of Chabad, that I heard that your grandfather, he used to have a little, it's called Shmektabak, right? Well, how do you say that? It's little spices. Yeah, like, yeah, smelling, uh, tabak, you know, smelling uh, tobacco or... or uh, Sh yeah. There you go. Sniff. Snap. 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 We used to use it on Yom Kippur to make the fast go quicker. Yeah. But don't, don't do it too quickly. All right? You get dizzy. Yeah, you get dizzy. It's this very spiced, uh, strong, uh, uh, like 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 basamim, like we spell on uh, yeah. on on, on Matzah Shabbos, right? Herbs and so forth. So somebody said that the Alter Rebbe had his little snuff uh, box, and he broke it in order to use the mirror that was on the top part of it to adjust his tefillin in the morning. The tefillin on the head is supposed to be in an exact spot. So he tells the Alter Rebbe's grandson, who is now the Rebbe, the Tzemach Tzedek, your grandfather broke off the lid of the stuff box to use the mirror for his tefillin. And his grandson said, he goes, no, I'm telling you, impossible. He says, why not? He says, my grandfather would never break anything. He may have removed the hinges, and used it, but break? Never. <laughs> What's the point? For a tzaddik, everything in God's material world, instead of viewing it as materialism, this was the whole revolution of Hasidism. It's a beautiful concept. It has to be done away with. Materialism, it's God's materialism, which means it's godly, which means it has to be elevated and utilized for a godly purpose. To break is counterproductive. That's not why God gave it to us. You want to gently remove it and use it for another, elevate it or bring it to another usage, that's fine. But never would break, would never break. And there are many stories of Chabad Rebbe's, that was their attitude. Nothing goes to waste. And you can watch the video of the dollar. The video doesn't lie. It's incredible. No movement goes to waste. We don't break things. We don't waste things. You don't waste food. I remember we threw out our plates. We ate 10% of the food and threw out the plate. And my father, who grew up in Russia, would look at it in horror. Not only, why does the Torah say you don't waste food? I mean, we understand wasteful thing, it's not good. But there's a, a spiritual component because that food was given to you on your plate to make a blessing, to be sustained by it, to use the energy that you get from that food that sustains you to go out and to make a difference in God's world and have an impact. Ah, instead of throwing it into the garbage. And if you don't want it, give it to somebody else. Save it for the next meal. We don't just, you ever see these kids? I see my kids at home. You take two bites of the peach and they're throwing it out. But what, what are you doing? What about the rest of the peach that needs to be elevated? It has to become part of your flesh and blood. That energy that you get, that's what it's all about. And that's why righteous people, and with this I'll conclude, righteous people, we said before, they value their material possessions more than their body. When we said it before, it sounded outrageous. Ah, now we understand it from a completely different level. 
The same reason why Jacob was obsessed about that jar that belonged to him. He put himself in danger and was attacked by the angel of Esav while his family was on the other side of the river because that container belonged to him. That container had godly sparks that he needed to elevate, just like he needed to make that terrible descent into the home of Lavan, marry his daughters and build the 10 tribe, the 12 tribes, the future of, the, of, the, of, Judea, of Judaism, because his soul was attracted to that place. And by the way, sometimes you have a certain craving and we blame it on this or that, when we are craving something, when we are attracted to something, there's a spiritual component to that too. We just have to understand what it is. But there's a connection that's drawing us there. It's not just a matter of physical pleasure and I want to indulge. It's much more than that. Tzaddikim, righteous people, prefer and cherish their material possessions more than their body because they don't care about themselves. They care about fulfilling God's will. And in that material possession lies their whole purpose, to come in contact with those objects and to elevate it. And everything is by divine providence. What is the definition of ownership according to the Torah? Not A and not B. Other. All of the above. It's an inherent spiritual connection between the sparks of this phone and my soul that's connected only to my soul. And there's nothing by chance. Everything is by divine design, orchestrated directly from God Almighty himself. Now we could go out and do the right thing with all that God has blessed us with and we do it with humility. And let me tell you on a personal level and I conclude with this, when we, our humble community, who had very humble beginnings during a time like this when property is through the roof was found ourselves in a position to be able to purchase a property in prime location there's only one appropriate reaction gratitude and humility what did we do right that god decided because my god you could be the greatest skeptic. There is no doubt this is straight from heaven. We have a good advocate. It's called the Rebbe, who's pushing our agenda and blessing us every day. And we ask ourselves, what did we do right? But more than the question, which we don't need an answer for, we got to continue. And we got to double and triple our efforts. And we have to make sure we're worthy of the facility that Hashem has blessed us with. Because it's a big one with a lot of rooms and a lot of space to grow. And that's by bringing more people in and inspiring additional souls and to be worthy of the gift that Hashem decided that our humble community deserves. And hopefully it will be a home that brings him joy, nachas, and we fulfill our shlichus. And of course, this goes for the generous, very generous supporters, who are sitting here, who are not here, support us in many, many different ways. It's a big merit. You've taken from your hard-earned dollars to be part of this. That money that you gave has been elevated to its highest, greatest heights because you have a piece of the mitzvahs that are gonna be done at this facility. And may Hashem continue to bless our community and may we continue making Him proud together with true love and Jewish unity. Amen.